Agostini and his colleague Brian Garrett here from Schwartz Hannum. Um, they're going to go through some training materials on mandated reporter and boundary training. Uh, there'll be some interactive components to it, um, and there'll be time for question and answer. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Battistini. And we are attorneys from uh, Schwartz Hannum, which is a small law firm just down the road in Andover, Massachusetts. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Beth and to John uh, for having us out here today. One of our favorite things to do um, is get out to our clients' campuses and meet with all of you. Um, we really do enjoy this, so thank you for, for having us. Um, we are a firm of only 12 lawyers, which in the law firm world is relatively small. Um, we're labeled as a boutique firm, and what that means is that we really practice in one small area of law. It's really two areas, and kind of at their intersection. And those are employment law, um, which is what my training was in. I was trained as an employment lawyer at one of the big international law firms in New York City. Uh, but the other area we practice is independent school law, and we represent almost 200 independent schools all up and down the eastern seaboard and all over the country. And so what we're doing today is really sits at the intersection of education law and employment law, and that is we're going to be talking about boundaries. Boundaries with students, and when those boundaries are violated, what obligations might you, might the school, have to make a mandatory report? So here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start by talking about mandatory reporting. And that, of course, is what are the obligations that you all may have and the school may have when you learn of allegations of child abuse or neglect. We're going to talk about employee-student boundaries as well and then boundaries between students. What are some of the issues that we need to be looking for as we enforce our school rules on a day-to-day -day basis? We're gonna talk about some strategies for establishing boundaries and where exactly those boundaries lie. We're also gonna talk about reference protocols and we're gonna talk about what it means to give a reference and what the danger can be sometimes in giving a reference for a colleague. What we've chosen to do this year, and some of you may have been at this training two years ago when our firm did it, what we typically do is we use hypotheticals uh, to draw out ideas that we're gonna be talking about. I will tell you most of the hypotheticals we use aren't really hypothetical because they actually happened uh, at our clients. Um, this year we decided to go to a case study method. And so what that means is we're going to follow one set of facts throughout the entire presentation. So it's going to evolve in chapters. And the idea is that each chapter is going to evoke some different topics, different conversation points um, that we're going to ask you all to talk about. Okay, so when we get to chapter one, which will be in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to find five or six friends next to you and have a short discussion somewhere in the three to five uh, minute range of kind of what your thoughts are with respect to the question that's posed by the hypothetical. My life was really simple when I used to just train employees. Um, and most employers are very, very uh, simple compared to a boarding school or really any independent school. And why is that? It's because you have all kinds of different relationships on your campus, many of which don't exist at most employers. That is, of course, relationships between students, between employees and students, between employees and employees, between employees and parents, employees, alumni, employees, board members. And what makes that even more complicated is that some of you probably wear more than one hat up there. You may be an employee of the school, but you also may be a parent. You may be an alumni of the school, and you may also be an employee. Um, so people wear a lot of different hats at different times uh, in independent schools, and especially at independent boarding schools, where many of you live here. So when we're talking about campus relationships, it's important to understand that we can't limit the word relationship and interaction to things that happen on this campus. Um, obviously, things in the classrooms, in the dorms, in the living spaces, that's the essence of what we're talking about, things that happen here on the school's campus. But we can't ignore when we're off campus, okay, when we're traveling for athletics uh, or for extracurricular activities, tutoring, advisory, to the extent that takes you off campus, school trips. And the biggest one in the last 10 years, really the last 20 years, um, is the introduction of interaction online, on the internet, social media, texting. None of that is really on the campus, so to say. But it's just as relevant for our purposes. And I would say one out of every two cases that we get in these days involving a boundary violation includes some kind of electronic communication, whether it be text messages, social media. <laughs> so with that, let's jump into the hypothetical. Okay, and this is the case study we're gonna stick with. So let's meet the parties. We're gonna meet Bay Academy. When I travel to New Jersey tomorrow, this will be Garden Academy. But today it's Bay Academy. Yeah. Oh. Bay Academy is a 9 to 12 independent boarding school located in Massachusetts. 
Let's meet Michaela. And I have apologies if anyone named Michaela is in the room. Michaela is a second year English teacher at Bay Academy. Michaela coaches the field hockey team and is an advisor. Meet Rob. Rob is an incoming ninth grade student at Bay Academy. Rob is very shy and struggled to make friends at his prior school. Rob is studious, has an excellent academic record, and is expected to make the varsity baseball team. Rob's cousin Drew is a current student at Bay Academy. Rob and Drew have been assigned to Michaela's advisee group. Meet Joelle. Joelle, a rising 10th grade student, is very engaged at the academy. She is class president and a junior captain of the field hockey team. She is very popular at the academy, both with her peers and with teachers. So that's kind of the setup of who the major players are going to be in our story. Let's get into chapter one. On a late September afternoon, Drew meets with his advisor, Michaela, to let her know that he is concerned about Rob. Drew tells Michaela that during the first weekend of the school year, Joelle hosted a gathering of academy students at her parents' house. Drew was invited and brought Rob along too. There was alcohol at the party, and Rob and Joelle both became rather intoxicated and hooked up. Everyone at the party knew about it. According to Drew, Rob had never drank before, alcohol before, and felt awful about what happened. Rob told Drew that he never wanted to hook up with Joelle, but that she was very persistent and that he felt pressured by her and by the other students at the party who were laughing and egging them on. Rob, sensitive, sensitive of not creating a bad reputation at his new, new school, told Drew not to tell anyone else that he was upset. Drew was concerned about Rob. So the first question here, and this is for you all to discuss, is does Michaela have an obligation to make a mandatory report? Does everyone know what a mandatory report is? Okay, so a mandatory report would be a report to the, D the Division of Children and Families here in Massachusetts of sexual abuse or of neglect. Okay, so the first question is, does this scenario present an obligation to make a mandatory report? So find five or six people next to you, have a conversation, and we're going to report back in about five minutes, okay?
Okay, let's come back together and have a discussion about this. So, so I need one brave soul to give me an answer. Does the school have an obligation to make a mandatory report? Anybody? We think so. Okay, well, let's do this the old-fashioned way. Who says yes? All right, that might be half the room. Who says no? That looks like the other half of the room. Who really doesn't know? All right, and your head of school just raised his hand, so that's always a good sign. And you know what? I'll tell you frankly, almost every mandatory reporting situation that, that we come across, you know, there are very rarely right answers. Um, the people who said yes, why do you think yes? Okay, so they might both be under the age of consent, which means what? The age of consent is 16. We don't know how old they are yet, right? But it could be a crime, potentially. Okay, is that a reason to report? Okay, who said no and why? Okay, okay, okay. So it's somewhat ambiguous. And that's a great point, because while what I'm training on today in large part is mandatory reporting, um, and that involves a report to DCF, just as important, and I would argue much more important, is the report that happens within the school. And here's why. Because DCF, as good as its intentions are, is under budget, and it has very, very difficult responsibilities in inner cities dealing with drug-addicted kids. It has priorities that often don't allow it to get to issues at boarding schools very quickly. That's just the reality. When a student here is struggling or in crisis, the school, through its leadership, can take action much quicker and much more effectively to help a student. Um, so the mandatory reporting laws we're going to see permits individuals to just make a mandatory report. That satisfies your obligation under the law. Um, but I don't think that satisfies your obligation to the child who is potentially in distress and who the school could help. So that's a great point. Is there another reason anyone thinks we might not be making a mandatory report here? Yes. Okay, so that is a good point, right? It didn't happen at the school. Now, why would supervision matter? Very good. So there are two things that we're reporting, okay? There are two kind of characteristics that we are, have an obligation under the law to report, and here's what they are. The first one is child abuse, which is defined as the non-accidental commission by any act, of any act by a caretaker upon a child under 18 which causes or creates a substantial risk of physical or emotional injury or constitutes a sexual offense under the laws of the Commonwealth or any sexual contact between a caretaker and a child under the same care of that individual. Child abuse can be physical, sexual, or emotional. So in the scenario we were talking about, why is it not child abuse? It's not by a caretaker. And when you're talking about child abuse that has to be reported to the state, that is a prerequisite that it be by a caretaker. Now again, that's only the legal requirement, okay? So clearly there are issues between students that even, that don't involve a caretaker that we would report. But let's see how a caretaker could be involved here. Okay, and we're gonna move to defining child neglect. In Massachusetts, neglect is defined as failure by a caretaker, either deliberately or through negligence or inability to take those actions necessary to provide a child with minimally adequate food, clothing, shelter, medical care, supervision, emotional stability, and growth or other essential care provided, however, that such an ability is not due solely to inadequate economic resources or solely to the existence of a handicapping condition. So this situation might be reportable, but not because two kids hooked up, um, because none of them were caretakers. It might be reportable uh, because it's arguable, at least, that the family that had these children over to their house was neglectful in the way that they cared for them. And we could learn facts as we investigate, and I think we would, that could end up showing that the family provided the beer, provided the alcohol, in which case we'd have a much stronger argument of neglect. 
In Massachusetts, we, the mandatory reporting law applies to certain individuals who are called mandatory reporters. And congratulations, pretty much every one of you in the room is a mandatory reporter in Massachusetts because you work for a school. And what that means is if you become aware of any allegation, any, any, any suspicion you have of abuse or neglect, you have an obligation to file a report with DCF. And so the definition under the state law includes a private school teacher, an educational administrator, guidance, or family counselor. Let's see what the law actually says. A mandated reporter who, in his professional capacity, has reasonable cause to believe that a child is suffering physical or emotional harm resulting from abuse, neglect, or physical dependence shall immediately communicate with the department orally, and within 48 hours shall file a written report. That's the legal definition, but a couple things I want to draw out of it and talk about. The first is the phrase reasonable cause, okay? It does not mean that you have to know. You don't have to know that there is abuse. You don't have to know that there is neglect. You have to have a reasonable cause uh, to, to believe it. That's a somewhat ambiguous standard. But the reason it's so ambiguous is because what the law is really trying to do is encourage people to report. It's supposed to be interpreted very liberally. The second phrase is immediately uh, communicate. Um, we construe that in our practice as within 24 hours. So we encourage schools to make a mandatory report within 24 hours of learning something, uh, learning about an allegation of abuse or neglect. That doesn't mean you should wait 24 hours to report it within the school. I think if I were you, the minute I had any kind of suspicion of abuse or neglect, anything that just didn't sit right with me, I would want to report it immediately to someone within the school. Yes? Good question, right? I mean, can we rely, this is hearsay, right? In the law, this is called hearsay, right? Oh, sorry, yeah, let me repeat the question. The question was, we only have the account of Drew here about the party. We don't know what Rob, who may be the alleged victim, uh, is gonna tell us about it, and we haven't talked to him. And that's a fair point. The question is, do we have reasonable cause without talking to this victim yet? And I think if I were counseling a school and they called me at this very moment, I would say, how quickly can we talk to Rob? How quickly can we get a counselor, someone to talk to Rob before we decide about whether or not we need to make a mandatory report? Okay, so the next slide kind of highlights a couple things that I think I already talked about. Um, the first is the reasonable cause standard. And that generally means that you're gonna be making a report prior to an official investigation. The idea is not that the school is gonna take it upon itself to investigate the situation before it makes a mandatory report. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to immediately decide, I do or do not have reasonable cause. You can certainly say, you know what, I don't have enough cause to make a report at this moment, but I'm gonna go talk to Rob, I'm gonna talk to Joel, and at some point along the way, you may find that you do have reasonable cause, okay? So when we're thinking about a mandatory reporting situation, we always have to be uh, evaluating and reevaluating whether we need to make a mandatory report. I said before that the law is written in a way to encourage reporting. Um, the law immunizes anybody or any institution that makes a good faith report. What that means is that Brooks as a school or you as an individual cannot be sued civilly, cannot be charged criminally, so long as you make a good faith mandatory report. That just means you really believe it. Honestly, the only case I've ever seen that involve a bad faith uh, account of abuse are in the divorce context where people are fighting over custody and making accusations against one another. I've never seen a school get accused of making a bad faith report. Um, note also that the Massachusetts law protects employees. So to the extent that an employee makes a mandatory report, it is unlawful for the employer to retaliate against them for having done so. So let's see what Brooks's policy says about making mandatory reports. Brooks School employees have an affirmative duty to report any suspected negligence and or abuse immediately to the head of school so that a determination can be made as to whether or not a report should be filed with the DCF. The failure of any employee to report his or her suspicions shall be cause for disciplinary action. Such reports will be promptly and confidentially acted upon. The Massachusetts law has a provision in it that's, you know, it, it allows for, uh, for individuals to designate, their, de to, to, to designate their responsibility, which means that any employee of a school or institution, such as a hospital as well, can satisfy their duty to make a mandatory report by bringing it to the attention of leadership. And so that's really what the policy encourages. 
Um, if individuals feel it, that they believe it's necessary to make their own report, um, the law certainly entitles them to do that. As I mentioned before, though, the critical takeaway from this is the DCF obligation is one thing. Helping the student is another thing and is much more important. And the school is going to be in the position, whether it's getting professional help, whether it's contacting the parents, whether it's notifying the police, the school is going to be in the position to really take the remedies that are going to help that child quickly. When you do file a DCF report, here's some of the things that you need to include. Um, again, the law says it needs to be filed immediately. We take that as within 24 hours. Um, there's a 24-hour hotline that you can call um, to make a report. Often, if a report is going to be accepted, they ask you to, um, to follow that up within 48 hours with a written report. I will tell you that a very high percentage of the time that we end up calling DCF, our clients end up calling DCF, the reports get screened out. Um, that is something that can happen, um, where the agency finds that for one reason or another, um, their jurisdiction doesn't cover it or they don't believe that there's a reasonable suspicion of, uh, of abuse or neglect. Um, our advice to our clients is almost always to over-report. Um, there's really no downside to doing so. Um, and the expectation uh, in the public is that where the school knows something, it's going to meet that requirement of mandatory reporting. I'll talk briefly about some of the consequences for failing to make a mandatory report. Uh, Massachusetts law does provide a fine of up to $1,000 for someone who doesn't report. And if a failure to report leads to bodily harm or death, um, that fine can go up to $5,000 and there can be tacked on up to two and a half years in jail. What I would say and what I think I would argue is that the non-monetary, the non-legal consequences of failing to report are much higher. Ending up in the Boston Globe for failing to make a, a mandatory report is a lot more detrimental not just to the individual who failed to make the report, uh, but also to the institution. And of course, you have kids who could be harmed by the failure to make a report. So those are really the reasons that it should be done. Um, the most famous example of not reporting uh, and sanctions for making a mandatory report happened at Penn State, and this involved the Jerry Sandusky scandal. Um, ultimately, the university president and two of the very senior administrators ended up going to jail in Pennsylvania, not because they touched a kid, uh, but because they got reports about it and they didn't take it seriously. All right, we're going to move on to chapter two of our case study. The following week, the dean of students hears a rumor that there is a video of Joelle and Rob hooking up circulating among students. The academy quickly investigates and learns that another 10th grade girl, Alex, who also attended the party, surreptitio surreptitiously videotaped portions of the encounter between Rob and Joelle on an iPhone. The video was then texted amongst a few students at the academy and eventually someone posted the video as an Instagram story. The dean of students knows that Rob is 15 years old and Joelle is 16 years old. The two questions for you to discuss are one, what should the dean of students do next, right now? Secondly, is the dean of students required to contact the authorities? You have five minutes.
I hate to cut off any conversation, but I'll be uh, subbing in for Matt here. We can bring it on back together and talk through this chapter of everything. So, I mean, as Matt was saying earlier, so much of what we see nowadays is coming through in kind of the social media context, internet, technology, things like this. So let's get into this one. Uh, let's go question by question here. Anyone want to think through aloud, you know, what should the Dean of Students do next? What are some steps here? That's what we're here for. We did not pay him to say that, but thank you. Yeah, no, others. You know, what, what, what steps do you think? Not everything, but some, some key steps up front that you would recommend. Say that again. Yep. Get a hold of the phone. Other people agree with that. Other things, other steps. Yeah, start reporting up the chain. I was talking about. I mean, this is now becoming a little bit more complex. It's gotten out. Students know about this. All right, so you get the phone. Let's start there. And you bring it in. What, what are you doing with that phone? Turn it off. <laughs> Good answer, right? So turn off. I mean, this is one of the key things here. What we're, what we're venturing into now are um, murky areas of child pornography, of sexting. And when you have anything, that could potentially be that, um, you'll start thinking about the laws. And we'll go through that in a moment. In terms of, you know, is it, uh, am I violating, are there any crimes implicated here by the students who are involved in this? Are there any crimes implicated if I even view this? Um, things along that nature. Anything else that, that, that folks are thinking through as this is coming up? Right, we still don't know. And perhaps there's evidence of that on the phone but we still don't know all the facts yet. So there is an element of actually following up, learning a little bit more. Now again, when you have this on the phone, um, and I'll jump ahead here, and we're dealing with child pornography. So under Massachusetts law, and federal law may also apply here as well, it's illegal to permit anyone under the age of 18 to be used in any kind of visual depiction. Now, this idea that it's illegal to both obviously show it, but to possess it, to distribute it. And so that's really a key concern, right? When this comes forward to you, you don't want to be sitting there looking at it. And you certainly don't want to be sending it out to anyone else. So you have to start doing your diligence in terms of figuring out how it is that you can understand more facts about what's happened without actually viewing anything here. Now, a key fact from this past slide here, the ages. I mean, does that have any impact in how we think about this? Someone want to jump in, speak up on that. The below the age of consent, right? So does that, does that matter here? Now, certainly it's mattering as, as we're thinking about the sexual interaction between the two of them. But under the law here, whether or not, you know, you're under the age of consent, even if you're 16 or 17, if you're over the age of the con consent, you legally are prohibited from being able to consent to any type of child pornography. So there is no way you can be consenting if you're under age 18. So in this situation with both of the students, neither one of them is actually able to consent to this matter. They're both kind of unwittingly perhaps involved in what could be a potential, potential crime. So the fact that uh, they are under does not really create the defense. Um, and now another question that we had from back here, um, you know, is the dean of students required to contact the authorities? Let's touch on that a little bit. Who thinks that the dean of students should be contacting the authorities and what would that look like? Hey, okay, we'll do a show of hands. Contacting the authorities, who thinks so? All right, and then who thinks that maybe not, shouldn't be contacting the authorities? You know, one, anyone un unsure in the middle? All right, so we seem a little bit more uh, uh, at least positive that we should be contacting the authorities. Someone who raised their hand for contacting the authorities who exactly are we reporting this out to? Okay. Others, right? I mean, yeah, we have the local authority. So we have police, we also have mandated reporting. Does anyone think that this in and of itself should be a mandatory report? Okay. Seeing some yeses, I see a hand. Right, so you're, you're the, the concern about this getting out even further. 
Now, any, any other thoughts in terms of mandatory reporting? This some stuff that Matt had just gone through. Yeah. Yeah, what is meant by that? I mean, again, we don't even know what's on the tape right. or what's on the video. Yeah. Yeah. Right, under the law, like, is this something that actually could be following under? So we're not even sure even at that point, right? So in the, in the sense of do you have an obligation to report this out to police, under the law, you don't have an obligation to report this as a crime. Now, with that said, there are a lot of benefits to being able to actually go to the police and actually have something like this be addressed. You don't want to be looking what's on there because you don't want to be unwittingly involved in any kind of crime. And the police could actually be able to help actually stop that. Now we have it on the phone. We also potentially have it on Instagram. It could be in social media as well. And these are things to be considering and thinking through. But in terms of contacting the police, that actually can help in terms of potentially putting a bookend on it. There's no other way to really be sure that you're actually deleting what needs to be deleted. So there could be a potential for bringing them in. You also want to be thinking about the students, though, as well, in terms of their health, counseling them through. Is this something that would be, you know, do, be doing any sort of damage to them in terms of actually reporting this out to police? So these are just some considerations. So, you know, in here, we're hitting on child pornography laws. We're also thinking about sexting, and we can think about the legal framework for that as well. Now, under Massachusetts law, there is no law that expressly applies to sexting and saying that you cannot sext. Right. Obviously, this is still kind of wrapped up within child pornography laws, though. So we do look to those as some sort of guidance as to what we would be doing and how we would be handling that as well. And I think the most important thing that you see down here is that what you do if you receive the sex message, you report it up. You alert your supervisor. You don't forward it. You hold on to it. And then you start thinking through the next steps as you move up the chain. So. That's kind of the legal framework with which we're working, and I was touching a moment ago, also thinking about just like the student-to-student -student relationships and, and how we should be thinking about that on campus as kids are getting into situations like these because they do obviously trigger or have the potential of triggering obligations for you to be reporting this up and outward. Age of consent, we're just hitting on that. In Massachusetts, it's 16. So anyone under the age of 16 cannot consent to intercourse. It's also 14 as well. Anyone under the age of 14 can consent to indecent touching, which involves touching the buttocks, breasts, genitals. So with these sort of situations, it's always going to be playing a factor in mind and thinking of the age of them, of the, uh, of the students that are involved, um, whether or not they can even consent to any type of conduct that they're engaging in and then how that impacts your responsibilities to be able to address it effectively and work with the school to kind of best help the student move from that. Because again, as it says in the bottom, any innocuous touching, as students are figuring things out and they're going through relationships, they could be involving themselves in potential crimes. And that becomes obviously a lot more serious and how to handle that. So obviously, serious consequences of the sexual activity, you know, there could be crimes that could be involved here. There could be violations of school policy. And we'll kind of touch on that in just a moment here in terms of what are some of those policies. And because of that, the school should be thinking about, is this a situation in which we want to have a disciplinary response to this? Is this a situation where we want to actually um, come down on folks? Yeah. Right. So the, so the question here, so it's almost a two part. Is there any obligation under the law to be reporting this to the parents? Anyone have any, any thoughts on that if I throw that out to the crowd? Now, I don't, there is no legal obligation necessarily for you to be reporting to the parents. Now, I think as a school and what you're trying to accomplish here and the culture that you set, that's, that's always going to be a very early portion of what you would want to do in terms of bringing the parents involved, finding this out. I mean, where we started with chapter one with Matt in terms of this party, you're going to need to know more in terms of where, you know, the, the party being held at Joelle's house, where were her parents during this, and what do they know just with respect to that. But then once you get involved in any kind of sexual activity, then obviously they're going to want to know, and you should be bringing them as part of the loop, too. Schools have language either within their enrollment contract or in the handbook that talks about 
communication flow between parents and school and cooperation on both sides. And we have seen cases where school faculty have found out about a prescription drug, kids have felt coming, and have stopped. Uh, the school has not told the parents. Um, and later, parents have brought claims to level one prevention schools based on their own clinical trials. So that's not a legal requirement in a sense, but it becomes one to the extent it can be considered a, a breach of contract. So, you know, I think the, school, you know, the school's culture is clearly to get the parents involved, whether it be in terms of, of, of those issues. One other point I'll make, Massachusetts, as progressive as it is in a lot of ways, is not very progressive when it comes to um, to sex laws involving young children. And you just saw two examples of that. One is the statutory rape law in Massachusetts, which has no Romeo and Juliet exception. Does anyone know what that is? That's like a four-year grace period where it says that people within four years of age can't statutorily rape each other. It's consent is presumed down to a threshold of consent, right? Um, most states not half of the states, a lot of the ones in New England have a Romeo and Juliet law. In Massachusetts, technically, kids could be one kid could be one day older than the other, and if they had sex when the one was just turned 16 and the other was 15, that's a felony in Massachusetts. So that's one example. Um, the second example is this sex thing. Massachusetts doesn't have a sex thing law. A lot of states have realized that kids with phones taking pictures of themselves isn't and sending it to each other isn't the same as someone taking pictures of kids and recording them in the public park. And so they passed laws that decriminalize um, take kids taking pictures of themselves and sending that to other kids. The child pornography laws were not written for cell phones. They were not written for instant messaging. They were written years before. Uh, I mean, think about 50 years ago if you wanted to distribute child pornography. I mean, you had to get film. You had to get a camera. You had to go to CVS, right? Like there were a lot of steps. Nowadays, it's literally just <laughs> click, send, right? And so the laws have not caught up in a lot of states. And unfortunately, Massachusetts is one of the states that in a lot of ways is very regressive when it comes to the laws that apply to kids. And kids don't realize that. Um, and so you know, I think one of the next slides Brian's going to talk about is that educating them on these, you know, these points is, is really important. Yeah, so I mean, a bunch of key points there. Number one, thinking about what it is the school's policies on these uh, matters, right? So the school has set up in the student handbook these policies and expectations for interpersonal relationships. This is kind of a foundation for students about how they should be engaging in, in interactions, both in a sexual nature as well as just interpersonally. It touches on aspects of bullying and harassment and discrimination, uh, as well as things like sexual assault, sexual harassment. And uh, I would advise that everyone take a moment to be able to review that and to kind of condense what it is in there. And that's what's being broadcasted out. Now, it also sets up a very kind of logistical set of protocols for what should be happening in these types of situations when you learn. How do you report of complaints? How are they moved up the chain? How are they investigated by the school? And involved in that process is how do we contact parents? When do we contact parents? Because that information will be detailed in there. And so it's, it's, it becomes a critical piece, both as guidance for students, but guidance for faculty administrators as well to be thinking about how exactly it is that you go through all of this. And the second point that Matt was talking about here is taking the time to be working with students about these issues, trying to reach them and talk to them on their level about the situations that they might be facing, both whether it's through, through peer pressure or just their sexual development, but its ability to talk through the policies that the school has and some of the protocols that you go about but also just being able to talk more broadly and openly about what it is that they're experiencing and having an age appropriate sort of discussion um, that kind of brings them up to speed on what it is that the school does and does not do with respect to these types of interactions. So being able to have that discussion about not only how do you handle these, but what are the consequences as well. I mean, again, a lot of students will not know that what they could be engaging in would be a potential crime like sending out or posting on Instagram a video of their friends hooking up, whatever that might mean. So the idea that there are actual real life and real world implications for what they do does have some, in, uh, some impact. Um, and to be able to have that sort of conversation with students so that they are better aware of that, that, that is something that, to be doing here. Um, and also, I mean, a couple slides ago, we we're talking at the bottom, we had these points about counseling response and teachable moments 
you know, so it's more than just letting them know the consequences as serious as they might be, but then to also be thinking through, you know, what are the areas of support on campus for students who are going through this? Where can they talk, whether it's a counselor or the health office, some trusted uh, adult, when they're experiencing, whether it's sexual assault or harassment, some sort of form of bullying, those things. So being able to kind of provide them and make sure that that is expressly clear or at least portrayed to them is helpful. Another uh, policy that has a big impact, especially as we are talking about sexting and technology, is the acceptable use policy that's also in the school's handbook. So going through what's in the student acceptable use policy here, um, it's, it's uh, very detailed in the sense of what can and cannot be done, what's acceptable, what's not permissible on campus for students so that they have a better idea and so that they know exactly where the boundaries are that they can and should not be crossing uh, when it comes to involving in any sort of technology. So examples of that again come up with the, you know, texting, any sort of inappropriate images, any kind of sexual content, that for sure, but other ways that they get involved on and get onto school um, internet systems and how they're using the internet systems or any kind of network systems on, at the school, um, you know, what are the boundaries for that? So um, another policy that kind of dictates what you should be thinking about with respect to technology use. And with that, we'll jump into chapter three and keep moving forward. So here the Dean of Students confronts Alex about the video. Alex breaks down crying and confesses that she recorded the encounter as part of her initiation to the speech and debate club. <laughs> All right, she tells the Dean that the club requires new members to do something outrageous and inventive. Alex also tells the Dean that she feels terrible because of her video gossip about Rob and Joelle is spread at the academy. Apparently, Joelle has been called a slut and hissed at by other students. According to Alex, a group of junior and senior girls attended Joelle's last field hockey game and booed loudly every time that she touched the ball. So a couple questions to be discussing in your small group. What should the Dean of Students do next? And what obligations does the school have under the law? So I'll give you another three, five minutes. Shut up, and we'll switch off.
All right, we're going to come together and talk about chapter number three. Let's start with what the Dean of Students should do. Who has some ideas? What do we think? Don't make me pick on the Dean of Students. Come on. Right, and what do we call that when there's some kind of initial hazing, right? And then if it's requirements, if it's a requirements class, it's not going to be enough. Because even if you have the requirements class, it's going to be enough to get you So there could be a disciplinary response here, right? right? For sure. Um, there could be a counseling response, right? We have a student, Joelle, who, if she wasn't already in crisis based on the video, uh, maybe in crisis now. So those are two things that in these situations we're always very concerned about is, is there a student in crisis and is there a counseling or a health uh, response to the situation? And that's our philosophy when we're dealing with student issues. We always look at health, counseling first, and then we think about discipline second. Uh, but certainly there's gonna be probably a little bit of everything in this. Hazing was mentioned. What else could this be? Bullying. Yeah, and, and Massachusetts has pretty robust laws on both bullying and hazing. Um, and it's funny because, you know, something must have happened in the 1950s, late 1950s, because every state has a hazing law that was written in the late 1950s or early 1960s. Most of them criminalize hazing. That's what they typically do, and it'll be a criminal penalty for anyone who engages in the hazing. Um, it seems like Alex, even though she may be a perpetrator, in the sense that she took this video, she could also potentially be a victim of hazing. And so we don't want to lose sight of the fact that sometimes the people who are the perpetrators can also be victims. Sometimes people who are perpetrators, even if they're not victims, can have issues going on in their personal lives or in their school life that can be making them act out that way. And so we really hate using the word perpetrator and victim. Uh, it's vernacular that's become very commonplace in the investigation context. But we want to remember at all times that the kids who are perpetrating these rule violations um, are also our kids. And it's our job to make sure that they are safe and cared for as well. So what obligations might the school have under the law now that we've talked about what this could be? Does anybody know? Do we have to tell someone about bullying or hazing? The answer is yes on both. Uh, Massachusetts has a pretty comprehensive uh, bullying law that requires every school, public and private, to have a bullying intervention plan. Um, I, I criticized Massachusetts law before, but I have to say that is relatively unique, that the bullying law applies to private schools. Um, both of the jurisdictions I started my practice in New York and New Jersey, that's not required. Uh, it's required of all public schools, but it's not required of private schools. So bullying is something that we hear about a lot. Um, how is it defined under the state law? Well, it involves exerting power over another person. It involves some kind of verbal or physical conduct. It tends to involve repeat behavior, but doesn't have to, and it disrupts the experience at school. Well, that could be just about everything, right? That's pretty broad. And it really is a very broad law. And what I would say when thinking about the relationship between hazing and bullying is a Venn diagram. Hazing is literally a circle within bullying. You're really not going to find, I don't know, maybe you could become, be creative and think of one, but you're rarely going to find a circumstance where you have hazing that is not also going to constitute bullying. Whenever I'm counseling a school through any kind of student issue, I always have bullying in my mind because bullying, uh, under the state law, um, it creates this obligation to follow your school's bullying plan. And sometimes that can involve an investigation with discrete steps. Sometimes it can involve a report to the state. So I always want to make sure that even when I'm investigating a sexual assault case, I have bullying in the back of my mind. Is that something that we need to be concerned about? So what is the school's definition of bullying? Well, it pretty closely mirrors what the state law is. Um, the state law for both bullying and hazing gives us a definition. Um, so many schools like Brooks have, have adopted that definition. Here's what it says. Bullying is defined as the use by one or more students or members of the faculty staff of a written, verbal, or electronic expression or physical act or gesture or any combination thereof directed at a target that 
causes physical or emotional harm to the student or damage to the student's property, places the student in reasonable fear of the harm uh, to the student or of damage to the student's property, creates a hostile work environment at school for the student, infringes on the rights of the student at school, or materially or substantially disrupts the educational process or the orderly operations of the school. Again, this is pretty broad, but read this definition. Become familiar with it. It's everyone in this room's job to enforce the policies of the school, and so that really includes bullying. Not surprisingly, a lot of the bullying that we see these days, I think I said this earlier, you know, most of what we see these days between kids has some component of electronic communication, often social media, uh, but not always. So the school and the law also have a definition of cyberbullying. I won't read it all. It basically says cyberbullying is the use of certain technologies, including electronic mail, internet communications, instant messages, and facsimile communications, to engage in bullying. Um, that's essentially what the definition is. Uh, but it's important to understand that both the school's policies and the law prohibit cyberbullying just the same as they prohibit bullying. When responding to bullying, as I mentioned before, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we not only have a victim, but we have bullies, the bully as well. And in a lot of cases, the bully may need just as much help or as much counseling as the student being bullied. It's important to hear what the bully has to say. It's important to understand why the bully is bullying. Um, in this case, we have hazing involving Alice. It could be that she is being hazed, which resulted in her bullying somebody. It's kind of a complicated web. But it's not always so easy to discern who is the victim and who is the perpetrator. Sometimes people wear multiple hats. Um, again, whenever we're thinking about student issues, we're always looking first at counseling and student health and second at discipline. So the Massachusetts hazing law, as I mentioned, like many other states, was written a long time ago in the 1950s. It's really a criminal statute, um, and it prescribes some criminal um, penalties for hazing. The important thing to note about hazing is that consent is not a defense, right? If the baseball team is making all the, you know, the new recruits dress up in women's clothes and take pictures or something, that is not, uh, the fact that they consented and did it voluntarily does not provide a defense to hazing. So the school's definition of hazing, it says, hazing shall mean any conduct or method of initiation into any student organization, even the speech and debate club, whether on public or private property, which willfully or recklessly endangers the physical or mental health of any student or other person. It shall include whipping, beating, branding, forced calisthenics, exposure to weather, forced consumption of food, liquor, beverage, drug, or other substance, or any other brutal treatment or forced physical activity which is likely to adversely affect the physical safety, health or safety of such student or other person, or which subjects such student or other person to extreme mental distress, including extended deprivation of sleep or rest or extended isolation. Again, a lot of the concepts here are very similar to bullying. Um, and generally, when we see hazing, we treat it as bullying and then decide whether we have an additional, uh, additional reporting obligation. One final thing to note is the school's interpersonal misconduct policy. This is a student policy that governs how we expect students in our community to treat one another. Um, everyone should read this. I mean, here's what, it, here's what it says in a nutshell. The school does not tolerate verbal or physical behavior that constitutes bullying, including cyberbullying, harassment or discrimination, hazing, sexual assault, sexual harassment, and retaliation. The school is committed to promptly addressing any behavior that impedes the learning of any student or interferes with the experience of any other member of the school community. That's a pretty broad statement, and that's the idea of this policy against per in, uh, this policy regulating interpersonal misconduct. Um, the idea is that we're all here to enforce the rules, so we should know what those rules are and how we expect students to treat one another. All right, we're on to chapter four. All of the negative attention takes a toll on Rob, who feels ostracized at school and is suffering from stress and anxiety. He regularly seeks the support of his advisor, Michaela. Rob starts meeting with Michaela regularly and feels he has found someone to confide in about his anxiety at the academy. When the two meet, Michaela closes the door to her office at Rob's request so that he can speak more openly about his feelings. During one meeting when Rob broke down sobbing about eating alone in the dining hall because he didn't have any friends, Michaela gave him a long comforting hug. Since that meeting, Michaela has twice taken Rob in her car for lunch at a nearby clam shack so he wouldn't have to eat alone. Apologies to any Michaela's in the room. What specifically has Michaela done wrong? How could she have behaved differently and still helped Rob, you have five minutes.
All right, let's bring everyone back. And we'll pick this one up. So let's all come on back here. Let's talk about Michaela. Let's, let's go through the list of things that are happening here. And let's start out again, throwing it out to, to the, the crowd here. What specifically has Michaela uh, done wrong, if anything? So thoughts, who wants to jump in? Or about the close, uh, we got a, a hand back there, yeah. Sure, so you're, you're already jumping ahead in terms of what could be a potential step that she could do to actually help the situation here by letting someone know what's going on, being a little bit more engaged with those around her so that it can show that perhaps, you know, Rob's going through trouble, she's meeting with him. What are some other thoughts? I mean, what, let's, let's, let's kind of go through some of these, right? We're talking about behind a closed door. Yeah. It's a great, I mean, great question. What do you say? I mean, well, I mean, a student comes to you, they want to shut the door, you know they're going through a tough time. What do you say to that student in that situation? Any thoughts? Yeah. Sure. I mean, does anyone disagree with that? I mean, does anyone think that under no circumstances you would ever want to close the door with a student? Perhaps, right? Absolutely, and I mean, something that comes in the door to us as attorneys and things that we'll always say is that, well, it really depends, right? It depends. Can you have a closed door conversation with a student? It very much depends. You see someone like Rob in his situation and things that he's going through, he's really looking for someone to reach out to and trust. You know, you go for that, and, and if you have to have the closed door uh, conversation, you have that. And it differs from situation to situation here at the school, and it differs from school to school as well, how you handle and what's the culture at your school and handling those. But I think you're already jumping in and addressing, you know, that second part of the question. How could you have behaved differently to kind of help address some of the issues that seem to be screaming out here that, that could be seen as, uh, you know, improper. So what about some of the others? We had the closed doors, but you're also saying it seemed like you were getting to a point where it's crossing a line perhaps when you're taking them out um, for, for, for lunch. So let's, let's get some more conversation, some thoughts on having students in cars. Is that appropriate? What do people think? Yeah. That's right. So again, you're, you're kind of switching it up a little bit. Yeah, maybe it's okay to have, but it makes more sense to be doing it when there's two of them. And I think you're getting at the same issue as well as before in terms of letting people know what's happening, letting someone know that the student's going through a hard time, you're gonna have a closed door conversation with them, maybe you're gonna take them out. It just helps with the situation in terms of 
what looks like the optics of, of everything that's happening here, of, of any kind of impropriety. The more students you have, perhaps the better. Any other thoughts, I mean, in terms of that? Is it ever okay to take one student out? Or do you? Yeah, great point, right? So school's policies with respect to just having kids out. It seems like you wouldn't want to be sidestepping those at all. Because uh, again, that's just going to be creating problems and, and, and the transparency of everything looks to be pretty um, improper there. But so making sure that you're following through in school protocols for any students going out, if you're going to be taking them out, bringing more than one student if possible. Here in Rob's situation, it's unclear whether that's really possible given, given his state. But at least letting folks know what you're doing. Again, that kind of comes back into play. What about the long comforting hug? What are some thoughts, some chuckles, but what are some thoughts on that? Who has a thought on, is it appropriate to hug a student? What do you think? <laughs> Appreciate the reenactment, yeah. <laughs> hey, Rob. Sure. Yeah, great points. Uh, other thoughts on that? Start here and then. We'll Invite, yeah, yeah. Right, so I mean, there's a difference there between whether or not you are unilaterally engaging them for a hug or whether you're being responsive to perhaps them coming to you for a hug. You know, is there a difference there? Here's some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, that's an, an excellent point and something that we will be kind of hammering home as we, as we get into this second half of the presentation and thinking about appropriate boundaries between teachers, admin, and students is, you know, what is that line? Am I getting something out of this? Is this for my benefit or is this for the student's benefit? And that's an absolute key point. And something that you address too is the fact that, I mean, you are your own school here and the fact that you're also a boarding school really has sort of an impact on how you treat student relationships. You certainly have a different role, kind of this in loco parentis, something where you are actually standing in as a parental figure for a lot of students. That isn't really true in other day school contexts. So by having that, that really matters. And this other point here, where we're just touching on this, is really the perception of what you're doing and how this truly impacts um, you know, what relationships are appropriate and what might be crossing some lines. You know, the relationship between Michaela and Rob in very many ways seems like it could be very natural. It seems like that's something that's real that could be happening on campus. But to be thinking that anytime that happens, there are eyes on you. And that really will, will kind of generate whether it's suspicion or, um, you know, mistrust. Uh, in terms of what it is that you're doing and what is the actual purpose of that. So thinking about that with the closed doors or taking students out to lunch, or just having one-on-one -on -one time in general, understanding and always having in your mind what would other people be thinking of this if they saw it, and almost with the expectation that people are most likely actually seeing that. So I think that's just the, the, the huge takeaway from this portion of just thinking about the optics of everything. Yeah.
Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so we just went through four different things that happened all in succession. Now, in, in real time, that's probably not how that happens, right? This starts with closed door meetings. And perhaps that becomes a routine and regular thing. So already the line has kind of shifted at that point. Then it starts with more of a hug, you know, when you actually get more emotional and that sort of relationship has been developed with a student. So then there becomes more frequent hugs. Then there becomes the lunches. And as that, as you keep going through each of those steps, that line kind of keeps moving further and further in one direction or the other. And then all of a sudden you're looking at this through such a different lens. We jam pack this all into one hypothetical, right? Because you can just see it and it allows us to kind of use a, a launch pad to talk about all of them. But any one of those alone is kind of murky and fishy. Uh, they just might seem fishier when they're all compiled together. Any other thoughts here? Sure. Sure. Yeah. You have any in mind? Yeah, or anyone else too, not to not to put you on, but other things. I mean, we've talked about some of the optics in terms of letting other people know perhaps and following through on protocol, signing out. But any other, I mean, any one of these situations where you have a student who's in need, what you might be doing to kind of further your relationship with that student if they trust you, but what else could you be doing to help them? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Michaela, I mean, she's a teacher, so she's an advisor, so there's obviously a relationship there, but she isn't necessarily a trained counselor in these, and Rob seems to have developed a relationship with her or a trust in her, but that's not necessarily her forte. So bringing in the experts, right? bringing in a counselor. Any other thoughts, the things that you could be doing? Yeah, down here. Yeah. Right, yeah, getting things for him to be looking forward to, be involved with, maybe his interests. Any other thoughts? Yeah. That's great. Did everyone get a chance to hear that too? In terms of if you're an advisor, you might have, you know, five or six advisees. So why not just start holding meetings with all your advisees together and just let them talk generally about things. And in doing so, you allow Rob to kind of actually see maybe other students that could be going through similar, similar times and that he can start drawing connections with other students rather than finding that one person on campus that he needs to latch onto, in this case, Michaela. So again, there's that power in numbers. We're talking about taking multiple kids if you're going out to lunch, but this is kind of another version of that, which is great. All right, so let's, uh, let's bump on. Chapter five. So Rob shares with Michaela that, he, uh, that his anxiety and stress are overwhelming and that he is also feeling excessive pressure from his parents. Rob discloses that he has thoughts about suicide, but adds that he would never really do it. Michaela believes him. Rob does not want anyone else to know, especially his parents, and he requests that Michaela keep the matter strictly confidential. During this conversation, Michaela, Michaela shares with Rob, through tears, that she has been suffering from anxiety and depression. All right, bear with me. She's been suffering from anxiety and depression since her mother passed away last year, feeling that she and Rob have been making progress in their meetings and that she is the only adult he will confide in Michaela agrees to keep Rob's disclosures between the two of them. How is she handling her responsibilities here? And what should she be doing differently? So we'll give you three to five minutes. Get together as a group. We'll jump back.
Okay, we're gonna get back together here. Before I jump into chapter five, I got a question about mandatory reporting that I just wanna share with everybody. The question was this, if I'm a mandatory reporter because I'm an employee at the school, is my obligation only related to things I learn in my capacity as a teacher? Or if I'm just walking down the supermarket in North Andover and I see something, do I have an obligation to report it? And the answer is yes. The law does not say that mandatory reporters only have to report things they learn in their professional capacity. So once you have become a mandatory reporter, that obligation extends to all facets of your life. So great question. Um, we have two more questions up here, so I'd like to hear what you think about those. First one, how is Michaela handling her advising responsibilities? <laughs> Not well, okay. And more importantly, what should she be doing differently? And we've talked about some of this already. So any, any, any thoughts? Recuse herself. So is, is, is Michaela, does she have a good heart? Is she trying to do the right thing? Do we have any indication that she's doing anything improper yet? No. So what specifically should she be doing differently? Yes. That's pretty bad, right? Yeah. Right. Anything that's having to do with self-harm, anything having to do with, with drug use, um, that needs to be reported up through the school immediately, whether through counselors or through the dean of students. That needs to make its way uh, to leadership. And as I pointed out before, we've seen several lawsuits where schools have been sued for not providing uh, that information to parents. What other mistakes is she making here? There's another big one. And why is that a problem? Right, well that's right. <laughs> and the gentleman over there pointed it out very eloquently, probably better than, than I can do, but this really is, this comes down to the essence of what a boundary violation is. A boundary violation is when your interaction with a student becomes for your own benefit, whether entirely or just in part. Um, the minute that you're taking that action with respect to the student to fulfill some of, some of your own need, whether it's talking to them about Fortnite, I mean, it could be anything, um, but that's the essence of a boundary violation. That's really what it is. And so that was a great comment. And the gentleman just in front of him made another great comment, which was this, how do you know whether the interaction you're gonna engage in, even if you know it's not you know, for improper purposes, how do you know if it's okay? And a great barometer for that is to think how would I feel if the student's parents were watching this interaction? Would this be okay? Would I be comfortable with this being broadcast on Brooks's website for everybody to see? And if the answer is no, that's a pretty good indication that it's probably not an appropriate interaction with a student. So when we're talking about you know, risk in, in terms of you know, boundary violations with students, there's a number of different kind of aspects that we can be talking about. But the biggest one here with Michaela seems to be that she's fallen into the trap of trying to be Rob's friend. Trying to, she's become almost a peer and equal. Um, we're never peers of the kids. We are authority at all times. You're agents of the school and you're role models. That's really what, especially at a boarding school, I mean, that's what faculty are. Um, you're role models to the students. Um, students are gonna test boundaries. That's what they do. They're adolescents. It's not their job to maintain boundaries, it's ours, okay? That rests solely with the teachers. And so some of the things that you need to be doing, resisting the temptation to appear cool, resisting the desire to be liked by a student, obviously wearing professional and appropriate faculty attire. But what it comes down to is, when I'm talking to a student and I'm sharing information and I'm having an interaction, is sharing this information, is having this interaction in the student's interest, or is it self-serving, even partially? Because the minute that interaction becomes self-serving, the minute you care personally, you have an interest in what the student does or says, um, other than a professional interest, because I understand you all have professional interest in being good teachers, but the minute it becomes a personal interest, you've now crossed the boundary. And so that's really where that line is. Um, going back to the point of suicide, and, 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 and it was a great point, there was kind of a landmark case here in Massachusetts in May involving MIT. And this was a student, a graduate student, who lived off campus at MIT. And the question was, did the school have some kind of legal duty when it found out um, that this student either had contemplated or had attempted uh, suicide? And what the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts held, and that's the highest court 
within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, is that educational institutions have a duty to take reasonable measures to pre prevent suicide if there is actual knowledge of one, a student's recent suicide attempt, or two, a student's stated plan or intention to com commit suicide. It's not clear that Rob got to that level. I don't know if we, there certainly wasn't a suicide attempt. Was there a stated plan or intention to commit suicide? No, I don't know. Uh, we weren't there. But what are those reasonable measures that the, the court said the institution should take? Um, those included implementing any suicide prevention protocol and contacting appropriate officials. Um, it's important to note that even though this case was in the context of a university, in fact, a graduate school, those are adults, that student was living off campus, the court was still willing to find a duty to potentially stop this person from hurting themselves. That's a big jump in the law. It's very rare in the law that any of us have a duty for someone else's actions. That doesn't happen very often. One big instance where it happens is in the context of employment, because that can happen. But it's even rarer for there to be a duty in the law to prevent someone from hurting themselves. Literally the only time you see that in the law is with a fiduciary duty, such as between a priest and their parishioner, or between a psychiatrist or a doctor and their patient. But that's the kind of standard that the court comes very close to imposing. Um, in the decision, they talked about the idea that at a boarding school, at an institution where the institution is acting en loco parentis, this standard could be even higher. And God forbid a case comes down, and I'm sure someday it will, involving a student at a boarding school under similar circumstances, I have no doubt that court's not going to hesitate to impose that duty on the school. That's a long way of saying anything that to do with suicide, anything to do with self-harm, um, obviously needs to be reported uh, through the appropriate channel. Um, another thing that Michaela did wrong that we haven't talked about yet is she told Rob that she would keep it confidential. Okay? And that's not something that we can really do for a lot of reasons. Um, number one, you don't know what you're going to hear and you might have to make a mandatory report. So that's simple enough, right? You can't tell them you won't tell somebody what they're about to tell you because you don't know what it is. And there's a very good chance or at least some chance that it could lead to the obligation to make a mandatory report. So that's number one. Number two, though, um, is that our duty to the kids really prevents us from keeping things like this internal. Don't let yourselves be the last person who hears something like this before something bad happens. Share it. Make sure that the administration knows if there's a student in crisis who really needs help. All right, we're moving on to chapter six. It keeps getting worse. Emily, Michaela's colleague and good friend, has noticed the frequency of meetings between Rob and Michaela. She once saw Michaela leave a meeting with Rob with red eyes, as if she had been crying. A few days later, she saw Rob get into Michaela's car just before lunch. Emily asked Michaela about Rob, and Michaela says that Rob is troubled, that she is trying to help him, and that the Dean of Students knows everything. A few weeks later, Michaela and Emily are having drinks and dinner at a bar near campus over the weekend. Shortly before midnight, Michaela leaves her phone on their table while she goes to the bathroom, and a text message from a Rob appears. Are you around tonight? I need you. Emily sees the text. What should Emily do now? And should, should, should Emily have said something earlier? You have five minutes.
Okay. Uh, we got like 18. All right, so go. All right, let's all come back. You know, we have a little less than 20 minutes, so I think we're just gonna be rolling through the end here. We can wrap this up, but obviously let's start with chapter six. And with Emily and her predicament now, what exactly should Emily be doing and what, uh, you know, should she have said something earlier? So thoughts in the crowd. Great point. <laughs> Great point, right? Because it's from a Rob. Yes. We don't know if that's Rob the student, Rob some other boyfriend, some Rob some friend. Yeah. Hello, that Mary Jo. Exactly. I mean, the context of this matters a lot in this situation. And we've had the benefit now of following Rob through this entire process. We know that he has had at least thoughts of suicide. So something like this late on a you know, Saturday night could actually pose a very severe crisis that he's going through that you might not want to be in the position of handling and likely you shouldn't be in that position. That's something you should have stopped long before you got to this point. But you're in that situation now. And so how do you handle it and how do you approach it? Because he really could be needing it. Obviously, they could also be having a sexual relationship and this could mean something completely different as well. And so that's kind of part of the problem here. And so where we're heading with this is this idea of, you know, what are boundaries that you have electronically with students? And we've been talking about obviously just physical boundaries, touching, uh, hugging, going out together, closed doors, but in this context, how do you have a relationship with students electronically? And, you know, the obvious key takeaway is you want to be establishing clear boundaries with them with respect to that. So one thing listed here, texting. I mean, who here texts with students? Right? I, more and more and more we're seeing a lot of schools do this, obviously, because it's the way to get a hold of their attention, letting them know when assignments are coming up, when things are due, um, and it's becoming so much more commonplace. I've actually, I was talking to another school, something that they've used recently is they've engaged a third party where you actually text a third party and that third party has everyone else's phone numbers and then it sends it out to students as well. It's almost this kind of filter so that you're actually never directly texting with students, which I thought was kind of novel and cool. But obviously there is a necessity to doing that so that you are actually texting to get a hold of students. So being aware of just the circumstances of it. Are you texting them, you know, at 1030 at night with stuff? Maybe, maybe you have to. Maybe could you have scheduled it earlier so that at least, you know, the context doesn't look so bad. Are you texting everyone or are you texting individual students? Things along that nature. Social media, are you becoming friends with students? Are you getting friend requests from them? Um, or to follow, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, uh, Snapchat. So and we'll hit on the school's policy on that in just a second, but also the other anonymous and confidential apps, whether it's WhatsApp, Snapchat, things that can't be traced, obviously just have a tinge of some sort of impropriety to them because there is no written record of what's going on. So it's like the school's policy, the employee acceptable use policy. We were talking about the kids, the students, employee, I'm sorry, the students, acceptable use policy, but this one applies to everyone here. So Brooks School mandates that you do not engage in contact with currently enrolled students or those alumni or ex-students younger than 18 years of age, excluding family, in any capacity through a social networking website, whether it's Facebook, MySpace, Friendster, Instagram, Match.com, etc., <laughs> in which the students may perceive your relationship to be more of a friend rather than a mentor and adult. In short, do not extend or accept a friend request to or from any current student or ex-student younger than 18 years old. And now we have these case studies and we're talking about them. It's, you know, obviously elicits the chuckles from the crowd about what teachers are doing, but this is, again, a lot of times based in reality. And just last week, a big decision came down in a criminal trial in Maine against a teacher 
uh, that made some news, a teacher from Kennebunk uh, High School there, public high school, in terms of her relationship that she had with this student that very much resembles Michaela and Rob. So in that situation, we had a 17-year-old uh, male student, John Doe, so he's a little bit older than the Rob in our situation. He was struggling at school, though. He didn't have enough service hours to uh, graduate. He was falling behind. Jill La uh, Lamontagne, she was a health teacher there for, since 2012. She had her own family, a couple kids. She begins to start tutoring John and reaching out to him, trying to connect with him. And the rumors of a sexual relationship start to spread about the two of them. Now, the school does its own diligence. They hear about this. They start to investigate. The parties kind of deny that anything improper was going on. As the year goes on, it gets the graduation, and John Doe actually attempts suicide. He drinks a bunch of alcohol and takes a bunch of pills on graduation day. And as a result of that, the police get involved. They start having a much more kind of in-depth, intense investigation of what's happening. And what do they uncover? But they uncover extensive text messages between Jill and the student. So there's 94 messages. So uh, some of these include these exchanges, can't stop thinking about you, my heart is racing, will you call me and talk, right? They also admitted, both of them, that they were engaging in Snapchat chats, uh, Snapchat messages, which were obviously never recovered because they were just lost in the ether. There's a bunch of phone calls over the uh, five month period. And she actually sent him a recording as well as a text message. It was a recording of a Chris Young song. I had to look him up. Um, not sure if you know him here, but a country rock star with a lot of heartfelt love songs, including this one with these lyrics here. Right? So they gather all these, the police are doing the investigation and lo and behold, Rob, uh, Rob John Doe in this situation comes forward and says that they did engage in a sexual relationship on two instances and she gets brought to trial on this. Verdict comes down from the, uh, the jury last week and she's found not guilty of anything. He was making it up. He was making up the fact that they engaged in any type of sexual relationship. The rest of this, all this documentary evidence, completely true. This obviously happened, they were able to extract this. But really the relationship was that she was truly worried about him and she was reaching out to him and trying to connect with him because he was struggling. These messages of my heart is racing, she, you know, she was worried about him committing suicide. So there's just this way of perception about these types of interactions that, that have a lot of lasting impacts. Um, again, Matt was saying earlier, I mean, kids, they don't know the boundaries. They're, they're testing boundaries at all times, the students at the school. You have a student that comes forward and says something like that. They engage in a sexual relationship. That's really damaging to you, even if it's not true. There's no way to get around that, especially when you have this kind of evidence piling up against you. So it's, it's just a real case of something to be thinking about. Now, if we are to look at that, and if we are to look at, you know, sexual relationships, one of the issues is mandated reporting. Obviously, it's coming up. And we talked about it earlier, abuse and neglect. Now, under the definition of abuse, under Massachusetts law, the term includes a sexual offense or any sexual contact between a caretaker and a child under the care of that individual. So any time in which there is potential for that sort of, you know, sexual assault or any kind of contact between a teacher or an admin uh, and a student, a caretaker and a student, uh, you have that ability that there's going to be um, both mandatory reporting obligations and potentially criminal sexual assault. Now there's other laws that we have up here that prohibit uh, child sexual assault, obviously, you know, child rape, indecent uh, assault of a child under 14. So there's other things that come into play. And as we discussed earlier, it matters in terms of the age of consent between, you know, what kind of touching is appropriate. You know, under 16, you can't consent to sex. Under 14, you can't consent to any kind of indecent touching. So, Brooks, again, the school policy here. Each adult member of the community must not engage in or condone any type of sexual or romantic relationship with students or any behavior or communication with students that could be considered sexual or romantic in nature, including inappropriate personal stories or history, whether in person, written, or electronic. You're also prohibited from the use of illegal drugs or alcohol with or by students or contact with currently enrolled students or those alumni of X students younger than 18 and what you're trying to friend them, the social media policy that we were reading just a moment ago. Basically, the main takeaways when you're thinking about the actual boundaries between teachers, students, admin, faculty, uh, staff, anyone in students, if you see something, say something. If you're Emily in that situation where she was already kind of nervous and concerned weeks prior about her relationship or Michaela's relationship, 
she should have said something at that point. In the intervening two weeks, something sexual may have happened that could have been avoided had Emily said something earlier. So as for the bystanders in the group, obviously see something, say something. And you know, at the bottom, always asking, is this for the benefit of the student or is this for the benefit of myself? Right, that really important point that we touched on uh, that Matt kind of picked up again is just that when you are crossing or when it is for your personal benefit, you are crossing a line. And that line uh, is, 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 could be very damaging um, to the student for sure and to, to your own self as you are kind of wading through here. So other points that are obviously important, educate the student leaders, educate the students about this and just being aware of your situation here. And also, what are people thinking of me? What are your boss, your peers, your family? What would people think of what I am doing? Always a, a helpful moniker to be thinking about as you're going through navigating those boundaries. We have one last chapter. We are going to touch on it. We will just dive straight into a conversation. We have about five minutes left, so we'll just talk it through as a group, but let's go through it first. Emily brings her concerns to the Dean of Faculty, and the school begins a confidential investigation into Michaela's relationship with Rob. Both Rob and Michaela deny that they have engaged in any sexual conduct, but the Academy is not satisfied and the investigation continues. Meanwhile, Michaela, struggling due to the ongoing investigation and due to being far away from her father, who is living alone since, as we know, Michaela's mother had passed away, decides to apply for a teaching job at Garden Academy, near where her father lives. Michaela tells her colleague, Paul, about the job at Garden Academy and her desire to move closer to her family, to, uh, closer to her father, and asks Paul if he will write her a personal reference. Michaela asks Paul not to tell anyone at the Academy that she has applied for a job elsewhere. So how should Paul respond? Open discussion here. What are, what are some immediate thoughts from folks about the predicament that Paul is now in? Aware. Exactly. Great question, right? I mean, a lot of times when these are happening between Michaela and, and, and Rob, if, you know, Emily, you know, brought it up and there's an investigation going, that doesn't necessarily mean that the entire faculty and staff are aware of what's happening. So it's a great point. What is Paul aware of? And let's assume for the purposes here, he doesn't know anything. This is his friend. Right. It's difficult. Right? I mean, obviously, that's it's a red flag. Maybe it could be justified because she just doesn't want leadership at the school to know that she's looking elsewhere. But there's no doubt that that's already um, something that should be setting off alarms for you. Other folks. Yeah. Sure. Right. I mean, it's a, a great question in terms of, is he writing this reference as a personal? Am I your friend? Am I writing this in the context of, uh, as we're, you know, coworkers and colleagues and, and writing about that? And that depends. You know, you just write a blank reference and you send it with your own name. That, uh, that other school could look at it and could just think, well, this guy's a teacher with her at the school. This is actually a, a you know, professional reference, not necessarily just a personal one. It depends, you know, the optics of that matter. I mean, does anyone know what this is sort of getting at, what this is implicating, this larger trend, things that have been kind of written up in papers? Past the trash, exactly, right? So a couple years ago, Boston Spotlight, the Globe Spotlight team, you know, kind of uncovering this idea of teachers that were doing unspeakable things being passed around from school to school back historically and how that now impacts schools today. Thinking about that, what are your reference protocols and policies? Now, if you ever get something like this, it should just take a pause and think about, you know, what it is that you could be doing. And, and, and likely, if they're asking, don't tell anyone, that's, that's a clear red flag. Because more often than not, this is something that needs to be discussed at higher levels of school leadership before having kind of a more official response, potentially, um, about it.
Yeah. Um, so thank you all for your uh, your attention, your participation. <laughs> and we'll be here to take questions for a little while, and we'll be seeing you all tomorrow morning for harassment training, which is my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs>